Harper's Ferry, Virginia, October 16th, 1859. John Brown is holed up in the engine house besieged. A company of U.S. Marines wait outside. His negotiations with one of their officers, Jeb Stewart, have broken down. Stewart steps away and waves his hat. A signal to their commander, Robert E. Lee. Lee's Marines rush the door. A few fall wounded, but soon they're slamming on it with sledgehammers. Brown tells the hostages to stand against one wall to avoid crossfire. The Marines slam a ladder into the door like a battering ram. Wood splinters. It gives way. Brown kneels by his wounded sons, one living, one dead, and tells his men to sell their lives dearly. A Marine lieutenant runs straight for Brown and brings his sword down on the old man again and again and again. Thanks so much to HelloFresh for continuing to help us bring history to the table. Brown surely would have died then and there. That is, if the lieutenant had brought the right sword. You see, when news of the raid reached them, these troops had gotten ready so fast that Lee wasn't even wearing a uniform and the lieutenant attacking Brown had accidentally grabbed his parade sword. So, when he beat Brown with the dull blade, he concussed him and gashed his scalp, but failed to kill him. Soon, the Marines were dragging the wounded and dead out of the engine house. Of the Brown children, Oliver had succumbed during the night, while Watson, shot under a flag of truce, faded over the course of the day. Then all of the raiders were buried in an unmarked grave, apart from Watson. A southern doctor boiled his corpse, keeping the skeleton as a curiosity at his medical school. Brown himself, wounded badly enough he couldn't stand, was moved to the jail for questioning. By that time, reporters were on the scene and sat in for the interrogation. Neither Brown nor the authorities objected to this, because both thought if Brown's message spread, the country would surely take their side. In a way, they were both right. Brown was articulate and sincere. He parried the authorities' questions and argued his ethos of liberation with both scripture and the Constitution. He was also witty and quotable. In other words, he was exactly what you don't want a criminal to be when reporters are present. And simultaneously, his ideology was terrifying to slaveholders. Moreover, while awaiting trial, he wrote letters defending his actions, which newspapers reprinted across the country, all while his enemies wrangled over who would get to hang him. The simplest route, of course, would have been to prosecute him under federal law. After all, he had attacked federal property. But that didn't happen. See, Virginia Governor Henry Wise was furious that Brown had lived to see trial. He even called the residents of Harper's Ferry cowards for not killing Brown before the military arrived. Wise wanted Virginia to try and execute Brown just to prove a point. And he did get what he wanted. Yet the state of Virginia's obvious bias, its clear and rabid desire to kill a famous abolitionist, made the case appear tainted and partisan. While a federal trial would have arrayed the whole country against Brown, since again his actions were deeply unpopular even amongst abolitionists, Virginia's involvement let people pick sides. Brown's defense claimed he could not commit treason against Virginia, since he'd never been a resident, though logical, as you can imagine, that went nowhere fast. Next, his lawyers tried to enter an insanity plea, but Brown slapped that down right quick. To him, the argument that his beliefs in racial equality were a sign of mental illness was deeply offensive. Still wounded during the trial, he lay on the floor during the proceedings, but when it came time to give testimony, he stood despite great difficulty. He began by stating that had he taken these actions on behalf of the rich and powerful, he would have been rewarded rather than put on trial. But no, he had done so on behalf of the poor and those in bondage, as the Bible directs. I believe that to have interfered as I have done, on behalf of God's despised poor, was not wrong, but right. Now, if it is deemed necessary that I should forfeit my life for the furtherance of the ends of justice and mingle my blood with the blood of my children and with the blood of the millions in this slave country whose rights are disregarded by wicked, cruel, and unjust enactments, I submit. So let it be done. John Brown's courtroom speech swayed hearts across the North, but not always minds. His motives did stir sympathy in the northern abolitionists, but that was a long way from endorsing his actions. Even his bankrollers, the Secret Six, didn't want to be associated with him. Four fled to Canada and Europe, one had a breakdown and checked himself into an asylum, and only one, Thomas Higgins, submitted to a congressional inquiry. The committee was stacked with slaveholders and headed by Jefferson Davis. Higgins, claiming no knowledge of what Brown had planned, said he did not approve of the raid. But before leaving, he did ask to amend the record. Upon reconsidering, he did approve. 
not of the raid itself, but that radical action was needed to end the evil of slavery. Charlestown, Virginia, December 2nd, 1859. Brown sits on his coffin, headed to the gallows. He has no priest with him, having refused to be ministered to by a slave preacher. Soldiers surround the scaffold to dissuade rescue attempts, and the crowd that had come to watch Brown hang for treason included some deeply ironic witnesses. One is an instructor from Virginia Military Institute, Thomas Jackson, soon to be nicknamed Stonewall. Despite later taking part in an armed insurrection himself, neither he nor any other Confederate officers will be hanged for treason. Also, there's Governor Wise. In just over a year, he himself will author a plan to seize Harper's Ferry during the secession crisis. And despite serving as a Confederate general and refusing to make a post-war oath of allegiance, he too will not be hanged. And then, of course, there's Robert E. Lee. Though he will lead armies against the United States, killing hundreds of thousands, not only will he not be executed, he'll be made head of a college. Yet John Brown, whose actions killed less than two dozen in the cause of liberation, strangles on the rope. As he swings, an officer steps forward, yelling, So perish all the enemies of Virginia, all such enemies of the Union, all such foes of the human race. Brown had no final statement, save one. Before leaving jail to be executed, he'd put a strip of paper into the warden's hand. It read, I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away, but with blood. I had vainly flattered myself that without very much bloodshed, it might be done. His captured raiders shared the same fate. All across the North, church bells tolled in commemoration of Brown, whose motives they considered pure, if not his methods. Now, while most abolitionists disowned Brown, his actions roiled Southern politics. Southerners imagined that the North was full of Browns, just eager to sponsor slave rebellions. And though a few Southern newspapers counseled against overreacting, Brown's raid fed Southern propaganda and centered slavery in the national debate. This created division in the Democratic Party, with pro-slavery hardliners and moderates putting forth separate presidential candidates that split their votes. As a result, in the election of 1860, the Republican Abraham Lincoln, a moderate abolitionist prevented from appearing on the ballot of 10 slave states, won the election with less than 40% of the popular vote. And in response, states began to secede. And as they did, Brown's reputation began to improve among Northerners. After all, with war imminent, maybe he had been right that slavery could not be defeated peacefully. Brown became almost a folk saint, complete with heroic paintings of his life and especially his execution by men who had now themselves become traitors. Yet not all portrayals were respectful. When one Union regiment enlisted a sergeant also named John Brown, the soldiers started telling raucous jokes every time he reported for duty. <laughs> John Brown, aren't you moldering in the grave? <laughs> the joke became a song. John Brown's body that paired black humor with the concept that Brown's soul was marching on. On the eve of the Civil War, Union troops sang that song while marching out of Washington, D.C., scandalizing a minister who overheard it while stuck in traffic. He then turned to his companion, the abolitionist writer Julia Ward Howe, and said someone should write proper lyrics to such a rousing tune. So that misty night, she did. The words she wrote were pure brown, describing an apocalyptic purging of sin through divine retribution. A song where God wrathfully tramples grapes into bloody wine, unleashes divine lightning, and lurks just outside the firelight of army camps, where Union soldiers are made Christ-like in their sacrifice. And just so no one would miss the meaning, she ended it with a very unambiguous line. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. John Brown's body was moldering in the grave, but his soul was marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. We really hope you enjoyed our John Brown series as much as we enjoyed making it. This one actually means a lot to me because I was never taught any of this in school, and I feel like it's something that more people, especially in the U.S., should really know about. Actually, on that note, why not keep the discussion of history going and maybe, I don't know, talk about what you learned here in the last few weeks the next time you're hanging out with your friends or sitting around the dinner table. Plus, you know, it being the time of the episode, if you are looking for something tasty to cook to facilitate that very discussion, I am actually 
made pretty sure our friends at HelloFresh have got you covered. As I've mentioned before, HelloFresh is a delicious meal kit delivery service that I love that frees up a ton of my time by saving me from stressful meal planning and expensive trips to the grocery store. Instead, I just get all of the ingredients I need to prepare awesome home-cooked meals delivered right to my door. I get to do a super fun activity that I love that does not involve looking at a screen for once in my life, and then I'm eating something awesome in like a half hour or less. Plus, with over 40 recipes and now more than a hundred tasty add-on options available each week, that is a lot, you are sure to find something to please everyone. You want to go vegetarian or pescatarian or fit and wholesome meals? They got all those and more. And these days, since spring has sprung, that meant that my absolute favorite, the pork bulgogi bowls, were back on the menu, baby, which were super easy to make and the literal definition of a taste explosion in your mouth. I love them so much. Whereas Jeff was hyped to fire up the grill for their firehouse cheeseburgers and garlic potato wedges. And wouldn't you know it, the Matt and the cat just happened to be in the neighborhood for that. <laughs> <laughs> Heaven on earth with an onion slice, bud. But deliciousness aside, one of the other things that HelloFresh really gets right is their continued work on the sustainability and freshness fronts. Their produce goes from farm to your front door in under a week, their ingredients are pre-portioned, meaning less food waste, and HelloFresh's carbon footprint is 31% lower than meals made from supermarket ingredients, which we just love to see. So if you'd like to save money on meals and have fun making them, now's really the perfect time to give HelloFresh a try for yourself with this delectable deal. All you gotta do is go to HelloFresh.com and use the code EXTRACREDITS50 to get 50 percent off plus free shipping. And no, you didn't just mishear me over your growling stomach. You can actually save a ton of money on delicious meals that are super fun to cook while also supporting the content you love, the environment, and your grumbling tummy. Again, that is 50% off plus free shipping at HelloFresh.com using that code EXTRACREDITS50. I do believe your time and taste buds will thank you, and once again, so will we. Thank you so much for the support. What if I told you that Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angela Valenciana, Arcolite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kuya Koi, and Skylar Holmes were all legendary patrons? I'm not kidding. 